You're welcome back to the conversation here on New Central Television. Let's now go to Kenya, where citizens are getting ready to vote in a presidential election slated for tomorrow, August the 9th. The two front runners, Deputy President William Ruto and former Prime Minister Raila Odinga, have vowed to revive the East African country's economy as they make their final push for votes ahead of the polls. Lawyers David Nwaure and George Wakajoya and a centric former spy who wants to legalize marijuana are also in the fray. The bitterly fought race has sparked speculation Kenya may see its first presidential runoff with many worried at the challenge the resort could lead to street violence. Previous polls have been marred by violence and continue to cast a dark shadow over the country where 22.1 million voters will now choose the next president as well as senators, governors, lawmakers, women representatives and some 1,500 county officials. Now join us live for this conversation all the way from Nairobi, Kenya. We have Wilkista Aduma, Director, Run for Office. We also have Narima Wakojiwa, CEO, Siasa Place, Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you so much, ladies, for joining us in the conversation. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank so, you. Thank you. All right. So I'll start with Wilkista. In less than 24 hours, I mean... Kenyans will head to the post to pick the country's fifth president. And there's been a lot of speculation of probable violence going on. So tell us, what's the general mood in the country as we inch towards the D-Day? Well, um, it's been a long time coming. And I feel, um, you know, the, <clears throat> the electorate is in a mood where uh, most are our votes tomorrow and see uh, what the ballot reveals for us in terms of the tallying of who the next president possibly will be alongside the other five uh, electoral seats um, that are going to be up for grabs tomorrow. So I think uh, generally Kenyans uh, uh, Okay. Okay, we seem to be having some network uh, challenges with Narima. But I'd like to bring in, uh, with Will Kister, I'd like to bring in Narima here. Narima, the IEBC chairperson, the Independent and Electoral Boundaries Commission, the organisation responsible uh, for putting up the selections, the umpire, uh, chairperson Wafula Chebukati, has said the commission is printing 22,120,458 ballot papers, the exact number of registered voters. Are you expecting a large turnout of voters? Is there voter apathy? And uh, what's the mood like in the country? So at the moment, uh, there is a high, um, high apathy in the country, but then the turnout is going to be high. Kenya has a record for having over 70% turnout. And the reason why the Independent Elections and Boundaries Commission this time around decided not to print extra ballot papers is because we never have 100% voter mm. turnout. So they're predicting that we will hit about 60 and above, and that will mean that we will still have extra ballot papers. And so they're going to work with those ballot papers anyway. So they will come out to vote, Kenyans will come out to vote, so the number is continuously decreasing over time, but not as drastically. Uh, but we have seen young people this time haven't registered to vote, a very high number. So the fact that the registration of young people has declined by 5.27% shows that it's a decline that's pretty large because they now account for 39.8% of that 22.1 million compared to 2017, where they were 51%. But this is a global issue. This is happening around the world, in Africa, in Europe as well, where youth are questioning democracy. And they are wondering, does it make sense to go and line up? Uh, there's a lot of mistrust when we look at the institutions in charge of counting the votes, and also the systems where young people do feel that the people who are elected are just the same. The choices that they have are limited. So I do think it will be a high turnout, but I do believe that in elections to come, it will be a debate that will continue to go forth whether we should continue having elections and whether they are making an impact and whether young people want to engage in them. 
All right, Narima, aside uh, the issue of the voter apathy, what are the technicalities involved before one can be declared president and winner of the polls? Uh, because the last election cast quite a dark shadow on this election, especially with a runoff election. So do you feel that people are afraid that there might be a runoff election in this particular one? And what are the technicalities involved for declaring the president? Yes, people are um, afraid of a runoff. A runoff only happens when the results are way too close. Last time it's because of the annulment of the Supreme Court, where they said that there were issues in terms of mm. uh, processes during the voting. And so they decided that a rerun needed to be had. But normally for a candidate to win, in our law, they have to win 50 plus 1%. So they have to get half of the country and then plus 1%. And so both Honorable Raila Odinga and Deputy President William Ruto have a very large following as much as Azimio, which is under Honorable Raila, during the trends of the polls has been leading. He hasn't been leading that much. He's been leading with about 8%. So literally with this election, every vote will count uh, because they are way too close and none mm -hmm. of them in the polls that have been demonstrated mm -hmm. have been coming close to 50%. They are closest about 48%. So none of them have been covering 50 plus one. So that does mean that those who are undecided are going to have to make a choice. There's a larger undecided voting block that will have to decide. And normally when it comes to the announcement of the results, the IEBC, the independent body, does have a time period where they have to announce the results. And if people do not agree with the results, which is going to be expected, not just nationally, but also in the counties, which is our states, there are going to be cases in court. In the last election in 2017, we had hundreds of cases going to court, and some of them ended up in by-elections. We've already seen some confusion in terms of the distribution of ballot papers, which can be used as evidence in court, mm. frankly speaking. And it's already happening now in places like the coast with Mvita. And so when we talk about a rerun, the IEBC does have to announce the winner within the next 10 days. And after the winner is announced, if there are persons who want to dispute those results, there has to be a decision made by the courts within 60 days. And so we do have timelines within our constitution to make sure that there's a way forward so that we're not remaining in tension and a decision is made by the end of the year and we will know who our president is if it does end up in court. Thank you, Narima. Now, well, Kiste, let's take a look at the candidates. How much ideological differences exist uh, between them and uh, what are they offering the electorate? I do understand that in Africa, a lot of uh, politics is done without ideology. We do a lot of personality uh, politics. Is it the same in Kenya? Well, Kiste, can you hear us? Hello, Will Kister, are you there? Okay, uh, th these uh, are actually two issues because mm. we want candidates who will actually deal with the major issues yes. going on in Kenya. So I think I'll just direct that question to Narima since we're having difficulties uh, trying to I get I think Will Kister is still with us. Oh, Will Kister, okay. if you're still with us, please just go on. Right, uh, can you uh, repeat that again just one more time? Okay, I, my question was this. I said, uh, looking at the candidates, the front runners, these four candidates that are up for elections tomorrow on, on the ballot box, how much ideological differences exist between them and what are they offering the electorate? Right. Um, <clears throat> uh, the different campaigns do come off as uh, very similar to each other. For example, um, the as in your condition, uh, relying heavily uh, on social protection and, and promising cash transfers, especially for vulnerable people within the community, and sort of uh, building um, a base that would allow, you know, uh, women, young people, uh, people with disability and the elderly uh, survive within uh, the country as is. Um, when you look at the Kenya Kwanzaa uh, uh, coalition as well, they also speak heavily about recommendations in the manifesto uh, that sound, uh, you know, social democratic in a sense. Um, uh, when I look at Maure, Maure has not come out strongly because he does have a background uh, as being a religious leader, and 
my expectation of him was to bring in really the virtues or how we know men of the cloth to be. So in his but, campaign, but sorry he to brought in, he did say he was going to offer like 50% tax cut. Yes, he did say that. Um, however, the expectation is that he would really have brought out some of the virtues uh, in terms of the leadership that would sort of, uh, you know, emulate the steps of uh, the, the followers. For example, the Jesus Christ, who uh, is pretty much who he follows in, in, in the Christian faith. Uh, we don't see him coming out strongly to bring out some of these uh, some of these virtues, even through uh, the manifesto that he has presented as things that he will do. Even in the debate where we had his running mate uh, come out to debate uh, with uh, Wajakoya's running mate, we didn't really get a sense of uh, this is what we are advocating for, for example, as a party. So looking at the political parties across the board, the ideological uh, uh, inclinations are not very clear. So you can place uh, whether they're uh, where, whether they're practicing social democracy, uh, mm -hmm. whether they are leftist or rightist or liberals in a, in a sense, because their recommendations do have um, a bit of borrowing from every other thing. So it's not very clear what the ideological inclinations is. However, uh, Azimio has come out strongly to uh, champion for uh, you know social protection and inclusion. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Will Kista. You know, it's quite intriguing when politicians turn into, uh, what I call them, religious people, so to say. Well, let's hear from uh, uh, Narima right now. Narima, the two main candidates, Roy Lordinger is a Liu and William Ruto is a Kalenjin. But this is the first Kenyan election in the multi-party era where none of the front runners are from the biggest group, that is the Kikuyu. Now, how much of a key factor will ethnicity play in these elections? Um, I think that ethnicity still plays a significant factor because I believe that the conversation has changed because it's no longer being utilized in a very negative way where it's very toxic. So a lot of the language that has been used at rallies before an election has been negative toward a certain stereotype related to a tribe. So as much as none of the candidates are, you know, from the Kikuyu tribe, we do have to remember that all the deputy presidential candidates are Kikuyu. Mm. So Kikuyu still means a lot in our politics. So they still are a major bargaining chip and they are mainly selected based on how much of the vote can they influence. When they were announced as deputy candidates, what was looked at in the polls is whether they changed the ratings of the presidential candidate tickets. And that was a big deal. So right now what's happening, because what zoning has brought, when the different political parties came together under a coalition, which is Azimio, or a coalition, which is Kenya Kwanzaa, the candidate who is representing a particular seat, tribe was still a factor. How much are you able to mobilize where you are? How many people within that community belong to that tribe? And how are you going to be able to utilize your strengths in terms of bringing more people on board? So we are seeing different individuals moving from coalition to coalition. Just the other day, former governor of Nairobi, Sonko, moved from Azimio while he was under Wiper Party, which is mm -hmm. under Kalonzo yeah. Msoka, who is basically the kingpin for the Kamba, and he's Kamba himself, and he moved to Kenya Kwanzaa. And that was a big deal, uh, because here he is saying that I can influence, I can bring votes on board, not just the Kamba, but also young people as well. So I would say it has changed a little bit. Uh, we are now looking it, at it more as mobilizing power and not necessarily as negative, toxic ethnicity that we were seeing before where it was very tribal. Thank you, Narima. Now, I won't be doing justice if I don't ask this question. Just before we wrap things up, we have uh, two women on the panel. No, three. Rita is Thank not you. Kenyan, so <laughs> she can't vote in tomorrow's elections. Now, it's the first time in Kenyan politics that we'll see uh, front runners in the major elections have a deputy uh, presidential candidate as female. Let's talk about Martha Karua. How much of a difference is she bringing this Karua wave? Because it's... The first time, like I said, that a woman, uh, uh, she's she's the former justice minister. She brings in a lot, more than just uh, agenda. She brings in a lot to the table. Uh, will he play 
an important role. And I know people have been saying, uh, some critics, of feminists have been saying, you know, they used to call her Iron Lady. She's losing some of that iron just to make herself more appealing to, the, to, to men and not see her as threatening. What do you make of that and how much does she bring into this race? Right. I think um, the feminists are right in a sense because um, we have um, idolized Martha Karua for a long time in the space as being uh, the Iron Lady. But we have seen in her campaign that she has had to change a lot in terms of her personality to look more appealing to different sets of voters. So it is true in a sense that uh, she has had to tone down a notch uh, just to get uh, to be likable and to sway the voters is. And going back to when Martha was announced as a running mate for Right on Iboraila, at the time uh, when Martha was announced as, a, as the running mate, remember the women have really good mobilizing power and her being here is not just because uh, you know, of her accolades, but also because of uh, how the women organize and lobby within the political space. And that is why we see Martha. And remember, uh, I think she's the only candidate who got subjected to uh, rather, the, the running mates uh, of the Azimio coalition are the ones who got subjected to a vetting process. So she does come in recommended highly by that vetting committee and also from, you know, her background of social justice, which is very strong. Um, for me, it would be more of how she live up to the expectations that we have of her as a people and not just as women, because she is expected to come in and deliver reform. So mm. is she going to be able to step up and deliver the reform that people so want to see her uh, do through, you know, uh, her position as a deputy president and also going to head um, other, you know, other other bodies within uh, the functioning, especially on the judiciary arm of government. So we are waiting to really see how she delivers on her uh, mandate and also whether she live up to the expectations um, of Kenyans because of the standards that she has set, because her reputation does precede her as a very strong, staunch, and ardent woman leader who is a no-nonsense and is not corrupt. She says herself she's not hungry for wealth, mm. and she's here to work for the people and deliver for that office. Narima Ojiwab and Wilkista Duma, thank you very much for joining us on the conversation this evening. Uh, we hope to have you both at some point tomorrow. If you could just spare a few minutes, you can always <laughs> jump into our conversation. Uh, we have a whole full day of yeah. broadcast covering the Kenyan uh, elections. It's very important uh, for the region and, of course, Africa as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that's where we'll draw the cottons for today's edition of The Conversation. Do join us again on Tuesday. Yeah, tomorrow we'll be covering the Kenyan election all through giving you back-to-back -back analysis and live reports going on in Kenya. Yeah, the special studio opens at 4 a.m. West African time and we have all-day broadcasts. We'll be talking to our correspondents in Kenya and giving you all-day analysis here on New Central Television. I'm Benga Borowa. And I am Rita Omodia.